This is a look inside perhaps one of the strongest storms in recorded history. Damage is likely to be catastrophic. Super Typhoon Haiyan has made a direct hit on the island. You can see this is the greatest storm not only for this year, but this is going to go down in history. Where in the world is Ellen? Because of the recent disasters that have happened, this is a reflective story. These are all stories about people and how they were coping with disaster. The disaster being Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda. This is a stressful time, so there's cussing. This is your warning. Also, Yolanda happened in 2013, so these are recollections. And something, something, blah, blah, blah ethics. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me introduce Kit. Hello. She's going to narrate and fill in facts and set things up because her voice is so lovely, and we are taking advantage of her house right now. Do you want to say this, Kit? You know Alaska. That's where we are. So Super Typhoon Haiyan, also known as Yolanda, hit the Philippines on November 7th. Everything that survived the 7.2 earthquake a month before was washed away from the 280 kilometers an hour sustaining winds or the 17-foot storm surge that hit Tacloban and the other Lete Islands. Excuse the pun, but most of the Philippines was in deep water and things were really grim. Ellen was already on the island of Cebu and traveled to the capital city of Cebu City. She started hauling rice and making relief packages before going to the north part of the island to become an NGO liaison for the city of Bago. Ian Burgess arrived several days later and was working with some donors to clean up and get supplies to people further up on Cebu Island. While they worked independently, they were introduced by other NGOs and would share some stories over barbecue. After a disaster happens, it can bring out the best or the worst of people, or it brings out their true colors. Echoing what Ellen said earlier, these are recollections of people's reactions in a time of crisis. Act 1, Dirty Politics. Ellen reads the next clip from her journal. November 20th, 2013. I woke up really sad today, even though I had this super important task of helping sick people get to the hospital. The mayor's son-in-law asked me to find a bus, load it up with sick people, take it to the hospital where the Israelis were stationed, and then take them home. No problem, right? Except the logistics of this was way harder than it sounds. Step one, get the bus. No problem. But the bus owner didn't have a license to drive it full of people. Not that this has ever stopped him before. Step two, get another driver for the bus. Somehow this takes three hours. Step three, they inform me that there's no gas in the bus. So we go to the gas station. No petrol there. So then we have to take a tuk-tuk and go find gas. This takes two hours. Step four, we finally get to the neighboring town. Pick up the people. Only 15 show up out of the promised 50. We head to the Israeli hospital. Fast forward, everyone is fine. They get home okay. I feel super accomplished. But when I told this to the son-in-law, he was disappointed. Apparently, it was all for votes. I was his fucking puppet. At least, I guess we help some people. Across and down the street from the Barangay Hall was this big house. Comparatively, it was a mansion compared to most of the other houses and had quite a bit of land. And this was the Barangay captain's sister. And she prepared a lunch for us. You know, it was all really nice. It came out. They had just, you know, traditional Filipino food, lots of rice, salted fish, adobo. It a, got us a, a Coke with a straw in it. And uh, just making small talk, uh, you know, they asked if I was Catholic and all that kind of stuff. And she said that all the fish here, we got it from the Leyte Gulf. And it's been eating the dead bodies of the people from Leyte. You know, it's just a, it's pretty far-fetched. But she didn't know what people's problem was, that why they wouldn't eat the fish. Or she thought it was silly. 
at some point in the conversation too, she asked if I would deliver rice to her, if, if I would just deliver it to, to her and uh, give the remainder to her brother, the captain. And it was pretty, just pretty blatant that she was just asking, you know, just trying to curry favor. You know, meanwhile, there's people who haven't eaten for for days down the street. Tell her like we, you know, we don't have that much. We we have to cover everyone else, make sure everyone else gets food. It was just kind of sickening. It was a sickening moment. You know, she was. We were just sitting there eating this fish that many other people wouldn't touch at the moment, and. And then she, you know, in a very lavish home, was was asking to stockpile on these relief goods when her neighbors were starving. Act two, relief delivery. The trucks would drive up, and uh, sometimes they would announce their their plans before they got there, so people had time to prepare. Usually, they didn't have much time, or they would just show up. More often than not, they just showed up and just start unloading stuff and people would kind of freak out and rush the trucks and start climbing on them and fighting for it and stuff. And um, it would just, you know, devolve into chaos. And it even got so bad that the, the trucks would just bug out and they wouldn't unload all of the, all of the relief goods. Some of them, that happened a few times. Phase one is immediate relief, short-term restoration. Trying to establish order with rescue, medical attention, food, water, and shelter for tonight. Phase two is a little more long-term, sustainable food and water and longer-term shelter, health care, and starting to move in the direction of returning to school or work. There's this transitional phase where people want to feel useful, but they still need food and water. So the city installed a program where the community could check in at the hall, work for six hours in gathering and burning debris to clear roads in exchange for food. Usually, media would gather stories while delivering relief goods. Three days before American Thanksgiving, Ellen was on one of these story runs. She reads from her journal. November 25th, 2013. We got a list from the barangay captain and the driver blares the horn announcing us. People are lined up in the blazing sun already. It's hard to not feel dementedly powerful. I half expected someone to break into all of our food, glorious food, but then I remembered I was in the Philippines and they probably didn't know the lyrics. I wouldn't have wanted them to anyway. I snapped a picture of the line that formed. I would post it on Facebook and say, the real Black Friday line. No one would get it. No one will comment. No one will like it. Instead, for three seconds, they'll feel ashamed. And then a cute cat picture will distract them and then all will be forgotten. Everything I'm doing right now will be forgotten. We read off the list. People come up and get their bag for me. They hold my hand. They cry. Salamat, I utter, thank you. An elderly woman, her hair was speckled with gray ash and age, patiently waits on the side. She waits for her name to be called. I keep my eye on her. So far, no looters. No one was rushing the truck. We got lucky. We get to the end of the list, and the elderly woman is now crying. She approaches us and speaks in Saboino to the TV reporter, who is reading off the list. They have a discussion. The reporter looks ashamed and disgusted. Not at the woman, but just at the situation. She tells the cameraman to turn off the tape. She grabs a bag and hands it to the old woman, who cried even harder kissed the reporter, and then limped off. I asked the reporter what happened. She told me that the woman voted for the other guy, so her name wasn't on the list, even though she obviously worked. She was supposed to starve. Hmm. Everything is more fun in the Philippines. The phrase, everything is more fun in the Philippines, is plastered everywhere throughout the island. Mugs, t-shirts, calendars. It's a motto that people live by and recite often. Both Ian and Ellen think back to their times in the Philippines as being fun. They think back to this time with fondness and both can recall amazing people helping them through some pretty incredible times. Which brings us to Act 3, The Kindness of Strangers. Ian remembers Roberto, 
Roberto is a stark contrast to the devastation and loss in Dumb Italian. Sometimes he walks around with this uh, this black fedora and uh, a 45 on his hip and this big, goofy grin on his face. <laughs> Uh, he's one of the sweetest guys I've ever met. Um, his house was completely destroyed. There's nothing left. And even then, he was the host. He was tried so hard to be accommodating. The first night we got there, we rolled in on a garbage truck, and there was no security. We were promised security forces and uh, showed up, and no one was there. Apparently, they had all been... They were all diverted to Bogo because there were riots happening. And... Uh, it was pitch black, not knowing the villagers at all. Having just gone there, I was very worried about about possible theft. You know, so I talked to Roberto about it briefly, and I went to sleep and came out pretty soon after that just to check on everything. And it was raining outside pretty heavily, and found Roberto out there underneath the tin with his hat, and pistol, uh, just watching, guarding over everyone everything um and it just struck me how he was so humble and friendly and uh but he was still kind of the guardian of uh everything there just trying just trying to help people trying to do the right thing december 2nd 2013 every morning i wake up to a good morning text from regine she's 12 The most important thing in her life right now isn't the lack of a house or the fact that her mom and dad haven't been found yet, and probably won't be. Her biggest concern is the fact that her backpack and all of her school notes is missing. She loves school, so this is a big deal. I give her any update I know about the schools being reopened, but I don't know much. After conversing with Regine, I brush my teeth, and I would go to Celine's Bakery for my instant coffee and stale or moldy bread. At first, she didn't talk to me. But after a week or so, she warmed up, and now she shows me waterlogged pictures of her family, the socks that didn't fit her grandson anymore. She has the biggest toothless grin I've ever seen. Yesterday, she told me that she would teach me how to dance. The Philippines has this cool 60s swing fusion thing. And even though I don't have much to offer either of them, Regine or Celine, they're sharing their lives with me, which distracts me. And for that, I'm thankful. Good? Bad? It sounds like a nightmare. And Ellen, what what do you remember? I remember... I remember amazing things. I remember horrific things. I, don't, I remember awesome people. I remember sucky people. I remember um, having really fun times. I remember... God, fucking terrible times. I remember the fucking roosters. Um, and I remember it feeling like the biggest achievement unlocked ever. And it was probably one of the hardest things I ever did. But at the same time, it was like a super successful feeling. Um, But I, thinking back, like when I left, I felt disappointed. Ian did too. I have this clip that I'll play. Yeah, I guess uh, disappointed, you know, that was my first time being involved in that kind of relief effort. You mean disappointed in yourself and your abilities? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we just didn't feel like we did enough because we just didn't, we didn't know what to do. You know, we were new at this. We had no resources. We had very little money and we were just trying to do whatever we could. Um, The relief efforts are still going on and they will for decades. And it's heartbreaking, but at the same time, like it was so, it was so rewarding and it was hands down the highlight of my trip. So that's what I remember. I'm Kit Burroughs. You have heard from Ellen Lurie and Ian Burgess. Special thanks to John Butler Trio and Armand TJ for the music contribution. Thanks to Robin Giannatasio Mall for being amazing. For more stories of disaster relief in the Philippines, go to ellenlurie.com. There will be links in the show notes.